would you feed your friend the same way you feed yourself? Would you, if you were babysitting a seven-year-old, would you tell her she can't eat pizza because she's going to get fat? And, and when they say no, I say, why can't you say that to yourself? G'day, and welcome to Wellbeing. I'm Jack Hodgins. Today's episode is the last in our 13-part series on anorexia. In this episode, I'm going to be focusing on anorexia recovery with internationally renowned expert, Carolyn Coston. Having gone through her own anorexia journey, Carolyn became a psychotherapist in 1979. She is considered a pioneer in the field, having founded the first licensed residential home setting eating disorder treatment centre in 1996. Her program is unique as the recovery involves staff and the client shopping, eating and cooking together, attempting to invoke skills for long-term recovery from anorexia. More recently, Carolyn opened the Carolyn Coston Institute in 2017, which offers training for clinicians in the eating disorders field. Hello, Carolyn, and welcome to Wellbeing. Well, thank you for having me. What is the best time for someone to seek help with their anorexia? Well, certainly as soon as possible. I mean, because this is an illness that's progressive, and as it continues, people, I, I kind of call it uh, their brain gets hijacked, you know, by it. And so I think when someone starts losing weight, starts restricting a bunch of categories of food, and as soon as they start to feel, or their loved ones around them start to feel, this looks like something they can't sway from. It looks like it's no longer a choice anymore, like, oh, I'm going to skip desserts, when it becomes, I can't eat desserts. Because what happens in anorexia nervosa, it starts out, oh, certain food is fattening and I want to avoid that. And it becomes not certain food, all food starts to seem fattening. You, it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller, the amount and the kinds of food the person can eat. It feels comfortable eating. I would imagine then it would be very difficult for someone to ask for help with their anorexia. Well, we call anorexia nervosa ego syntonic, which means that the ego of the person who has it kind of feels successful. They feel like I'm doing, uh, I'm accomplishing, you know, like me, when I went on a diet in high school, all my friends went on a diet, and I'm the one who lost the weight, and I could do it, and other people couldn't do it, and I felt like, wow, you know, I'm so successful, and good at something. And partly that's a temperament thing. It's not 100%, but we know now with studies on genetic predisposition that that a, a huge percentage of people with anorexia nervosa have kind of a perfectionistic, driven personality, you know, the kind of kid who's, you know, getting the straight A's and all that. And they sort of, well, what I say all the time is in high school, I got straight A's in, gra- in my grades and a straight A in dieting, you know? Mm. It's just where you're applying that temperament to. So even watching kids when they're younger and noticing if they have that kind of temperament and you see them starting to apply it to food, um, that's something to be watchful for because when when you apply it to other things, like you're getting praised for it if you're getting good grades and things like that and you're so, so organized and you're the type that helps your mom all the time or whatever. But mm. when you start applying that to counting calories and fat grams, it's a whole different ballgame, you know? You went for your your own journey with eating disorders, is that right? I had, I developed an eating disorder when I was about 14, 15. It's hard to really say when it stops, and I have a section in a book I wrote called Your Dieting Daughter, where a chapter, you know, from, you know, how a person goes from maybe a diet to a disorder, you know, and, uh, yeah, so that happened to me in high school. I would say by the time I left for college, I was full, fully into anorexia nervosa, where you just you realize your 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 thinking changes. Everything evolves around how you're going to avoid food, how little food you could eat, how many hours you can go in between without having meals. And uh, yeah, I came back from college my first year and was very very ill and entrenched in it. And um, yeah, but at that time, that was in the 1970s and uh, 69, early 70s, and there weren't any treatment programs or books or, or anything. And um, 
I did recover and went on to become a therapist to treat adolescents. And then people started saying, oh, you know, there's this girl who has that thing you had. And I realized I just understood it. I felt like I was in the mindset. And uh, my first client got better and then someone else referred me. And so early on in this field, I, I just became known because I started seeing people so long ago, you know. You mentioned there that in the early 70s, there wasn't really a recovery kind of sector for anorexia. When did the recovery sector start to develop in that field? Well, there were a few hospitals who treated patients, you know, odd here and there, hospitals that had hospital units that would take patients who were super emaciated. But there was not really an understanding. There were no journals. There were no organizations, certainly like, you know, AMZ over there or AED over here or things like that, you know. And I would say in the 80s, you know, programs started happening more, um, but... But I actually opened the first residential treatment mm, program mm. for eating disorders in 1996. Before that, in the U.S., and I think throughout the world, there were no residential treatments. It was a patient got really ill and went to a hospital. I did run hospital programs before that, about the five or six years before that, um, hospital uh Instead of just having a patient come into the hospital, you know, and be in the hospital, they started opening up um, designated units for people. And I ran one of those. Um, well, I ran three of those, actually, and then realized, you know, these patients really, the problem with it is they go into a hospital, they're fed um, or tube fed at the worst, and then they go back home. Who's taught them how to go to the grocery store, mm-hmm. how to make meals, you know, how to start putting exercise back in their life? And I realized I need to open a residential where people live together, we take them grocery shopping, we teach them to make their own food, portion their own food, all of, all of those kinds of things. And that sort of changed the game of, of treatment. Residential is now pretty ubiquitous here in the U.S. And finally, Australia has its um, first one, Juan de Nerida, up on the Sunshine Coast. What does it look like step by step, the recovery? Well, it's certainly different for different people. I mean, I I do have a book called Eight Keys to Recovery, which sounds weird. I was asked by Norton and Sons to write this book, and my first response was, it's in a series of books they have called Eight Keys to Recovery from, you know, migraines or depression. And I said, eight? There's like so many. But I realized when I, I decided, what are the main factors and how do I put them, you know, together in eight, you know, huge categories? And so, you know, I mean, that tells a little, a little bit of it. But I would say the, the first really, really important thing, and um, if, if people get anything from this segment on your show or whatever, it would be this, that everybody who walks in the door has a healthy self. Every person I see with anorexia comes in, they have a healthy self in there. And it has been taken over by what I call this alter ego state, and that's the eating disorder self. And they might not recognize it at first, but when you begin to talk to them, you can ask them questions where they're they're smart. They know if you say, would you feed your friend the same way you feed yourself? Would you, if you were babysitting a seven-year-old, would you tell her she can't eat pizza because she's going to get fat? And and when they say no, which they do, I've not had anybody yet say, no, I would say that to a kid. Mm. Um, I say, why can't you say that to yourself? What has happened that you can't say that to yourself? The the battle is between you and you, the two parts that you're living with. And, and parents will say, I feel like I lost my kid. You know, I can't find my kid in there. There is a healthy self in there. The reason I think I have success is I recovered myself because I went through this myself. I had to realize I could hear voices in my head. I, I remember specifically going to a party in college and telling myself when I got to the party, you can't eat one thing at this party. And then another part of me said, but you know, that's easy for you. You can go in there and skip things. That's easy. What you have to do is do what other people do. Just have one cookie or two cookies or a piece of cake. You know, the fear when you have anorexia nervosa really is that you can't do that anymore because you're breaking your rules. You're going to, you don't know where it's going to end. You might go, what are you going to do the next day? You know, so this concept that I have called strengthening the healthy self where you don't get into a battle with the person because they will win. There, People die from anorexia nervosa because 
you can't really force anyone. You can put them in the hospital. You can do all kinds of supervision and force feeding and tube feeding. They get out. They can lose it again. And uh, the only way to heal somebody from this is to help them make this internal shift where I say, we're not going to get rid of this ego state that you have developed. We're going to integrate it back into your whole self and it will no longer need the eating disorder behaviors. It will just serve as your alarm system. Mm. You can still have control over things. You can, it'll still tell you if you, you know, um, if it was meeting some need, if your eating disorder was solving some purpose in your life, like it made you feel more special or it helped you feel in control. Your healthy self can do that in, in better ways, ways that aren't self-destructive. So I talk about integrating the eating mm-hmm. disorder self and healthy self, and it, and it really feels to patients like, um, you're not trying to get rid of me. You're not trying to get rid of something that I think is important. And, and I think that's been a big key. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is anorexia recovery expert, Carolyn Coston. I would imagine too that it would be a massive challenge for the person going through recovery, going through that, you know, trying to gain back that weight because that's such the that's almost the opposite of what their mind is telling them. How do you how do you approach that in the recovery sense? I feel like you have to do it slowly. I think that the problem sometimes with treatment programs is that they someone comes in, you have to sort of think of anorexia as a phobia, a phobia of fat and of eating fat and of gaining weight. And so when someone comes into treatment, for someone to set down the treatment goes, okay, you weigh, you know, 45 kilos and you need to weigh, you know, I don't know, 55 or 52 or whatever it is. That just freaks people out. It's sort of like saying to someone who has a phobia of snakes, you're going to have to hold 25 snakes before you leave. And what I think you need to do is go really slowly. I think you need the very first thing I do with anorexia nervosa is I tell people, let's see how much you can eat and stay the same which other people will stay the same, but the person needs to gain weight. But you have to disassociate the concept of food equals weight gain. Because if they have that in their mind forever, as soon as they can stop doing it, they'll stop doing it. So you can add all this food that gained weight, but they're afraid to keep on eating because they think they're going to keep on gaining. So the very first thing I do is, let's see how much you can eat and stay the same. And I was just on the on the phone today with a, a client um, who's a runner who had anorexia. I've seen her for a year. And uh, and we were just laughing about how when she first started, she thought for sure she was only eating about 800 to 1,000 calories a day and running several miles. And uh, so, of course, I was like, this, this is not sustainable, whatever. Let's just see how much you can eat and stay the same. And, you know, I, I was able to get her up to about 1,600 calories without any weight gain just to prove to her what you think in your mind isn't true. Your mind's been hijacked. You can eat more, your metabolism goes up, your hair gets better, your temperature goes up, your organs start working better. You need all this fuel for other things. Food doesn't always become weight gain and fat. So that's the first thing. And that's been a huge thing in helping people. And I kind of knew it from my own recovery so many years ago and then working in private practice. And then you start with small steps, like let's make a, you're going to gain two kilos and, um, and then when you get there, I'll let you hang out there for a while. Or maybe it's three kilos. When you get there, you can, we'll wait and we'll let your psyche kind of catch up with your body and let them get calm and accepting this new body. And I think the problem is when we try to hurry it along, get them in, get the weight up, all this, you know, I, mm. I think we get too impatient. You got to, with anorexia nervosa, I think you have to sit back and go, I'm in, I'm in this for the long haul. And I'm in this for an internal shift. And I don't want to do anything that makes the person, if I can help it, I mean, to save a life, I will. I've gone to court and got medical conservatorship to save someone's life. But if I can help it, I try to do it in collaboration with them, little bits and steps along the way, because it's so frightening for them. And I, I know that. I think I just had the assistance of having had it. So I, I knew that, you know, early on. For successful recovery, is it important to identify the possible reasons as to why the anorexia might? have developed like such some people like it's a a sense of control such a good question but here's my surprising answer i don't think you have to know why you got sick in order to get better i think people spend too much time i think inside 
Um, I think understanding the whys you developed anorexia is like a bridge, you know, an insight into, you know, why why that might have happened. But people get stuck on the bridge and uh, searching for the why. I think I I would have been stuck. I think. It's not that the why isn't important, and sometimes it's good, and especially if people are talking about their fear of losing control and things like that. But I've treated people who have had all kinds of histories and all kinds of things that happened, and it's not that I don't talk to them about it and have empathy for that, but at the end of the day, talking about those things doesn't change someone's behavior. If someone understands, oh, I was abused and that caused me to go into restricting for some reason, I mean, for one thing, you can say not everybody who's abused restricts their food, so we can't necessarily say that caused it, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm a very controlling person and so I just controlled my food. Well, a lot of people are controlling and they don't have anorexia nervosa. So we can look at the temperament and look at how you can ease up and mitigate your temperament, which I think is a good thing to do. But I think what's what's really important, and I tell people all the time, I don't know, have to know all the reasons why you got sick in order to help you get better. What What is the problem right now? What's interfering with your life? What can't you do with food that you used to be able to do? What can't you do with food that you'd like to be able to do? What have you lost? Like some people, lose relationships, they get, you know, kicked off the track team, they have to drop out of uni, there's all kinds of things that happen. And um, But even more importantly, control is usually a big issue. People like to feel like they have willpower and control. And one of the other things I do is I think it's super important to show people, you think you're in control, but you're not really in control anymore. Like it feels like you're in control, like, oh, I can control the calories I'm eating and all that. But I'll say, here's a cookie. I'll put a cookie in front of them and say, I show me you can eat that cookie because that's harder for you right now than not eating it. If you really want to show me you have willpower, you can eat the cookie. And that doesn't mean you have to ever eat cookies. You know, I don't care. I, I don't care if that's in your diet. But what I do care about is your brain is not obligated to not eat things, that you really have free will and a free choice. And um, so I'm using their logic. I think sometimes people try to say, oh, you shouldn't be so disciplined or you shouldn't ha rely so much on willpower or you're so controlling. And what I say is, look, you have that temperament. How do you use that for your best good? And how and how do you really show me that you have willpower? It would be, it's, it's you're going to show me because I know it's harder for you to eat that cookie. That's the hardest thing to do. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I get it. I get it. So in saying all those things... To be successful in recovery, for someone to be successful in recovery, what is the attitude they need to have going into recovery? I think it can, yeah, I'll take any attitude going into recovery because if I wait for people, some people say, you know, you have to be motivated to recover. And I think if I waited for clients to be motivated, I don't know how many people I would have helped fully recover. I think motivation is something that, in fact, that's the first key of the book, motivation, patience, and hope. And I talk about how it waxes and wanes. You might feel motivated, then you gain weight and you go, oh my God, I look so fat. I'm freaking out. You know, I can't stand it, you know, and, uh, and your motivation may go away for a while, or you might see someone else dieting and then you think they're thinner. There's lots of reasons that affect your motivation. So I, I don't, I, I don't think anybody ha has to be ready to get better because by definition, I think anybody who comes into treatment has ambivalence about it mm. at best. Because otherwise, when someone is really ready to do it, and they've been strong enough to, to develop anorexia nervosa, I take that same strength and put it towards recovery. In fact, I think a huge part of the work in therapy is helping motivate people, which is why you go a small step at a time and say, see how this feels. Your life's not ruined. You need a few pounds, you know? And I was talking to this person today and saying, um, we're talking about her life and how she can go out with, when I first met her, her she was only eating vegetables, you know, she couldn't go out to restaurants, and we were talking today about her relationships with people and how she's doing this uh, um, a whole hiking experience and how it's she's going out with people that she's meeting in, in terms of hiking partners and how she can do that and how she can have all these different foods and she had mashed potatoes and roasted chicken and dessert and because she could sit around the table so she's looking at and one of the questions is what are you gaining besides weight you know mm, mm. It's, it sounds like from what you've described then that it's very important that the environment that is created by the recovery center itself is is very important then 
I think it has to be holistic. I think it has to be collaborative. I think it has to be individualized. I think what happens in a lot of treatment is everybody comes in and they have the same rules, the same protocols. The exact. I mean, some rules have to be the same, obviously. Like some people with anorexia nervosa will purge or hide their food in their jacket pocket sitting at the table. You have to have some consistent rules that the staff knows how to follow. But also people have to be treated as as individuals and they have to have individual therapy and I and I and I think they have to know what they're recovering to or for the first seven keys of my of the eight keys book um, that actually I wrote with a former client who recovered and became a therapist we wrote the book together and that was kind of fun um, but but the first seven keys are all about what you're recovering from you know and the, but the last one is what are you recovering to and I think um, having recovered people they're uh, Showing them what they could have in their life is really key. Uh, for a long time, I think therapists were told to be kind of the blank slate and not too much self-disclosure. And I think with eating disorders, that's sad. And I've spoken all around Australia about this since about 2012, done a lot of, because in Australia, I would give a lecture and people would line up to talk to me. I'm talking about psychiatrists and psychologists mm -hmm. and physicians and say, oh, I had an eating disorder, but I don't ever tell my clients because it's frowned upon, it's looked down on. That's how it was here in the U.S. when I first started 40 plus years ago. And I just said, this is silly, you know? I mean, why would I not tell? I want to be a, a role model. I want to be a signal of hope. And the first international conference I did, I, I not only stood up and this was about, I don't know, 30 six years ago or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stood up and talked about being recovered. And I had about four or five, I can't remember, patients who I had treated who were recovered. And not just for a few months, but I mean a few years recovered. And, uh, and people came up to me then and said, you know, I've never, I'm treating people for this illness and I've never met anybody who has recovered. And I thought, how sad that is. How could you be a doctor, doctor treating cancer or anything, you know what I mean? Depression, anything, if you had mm. never seen anybody who, who had made it to the other side. So I just got even more bold about it, and I haven't looked back. You're listening to Wellbeing, a nationally distributed radio show and podcast. My guest today is anorexia recovery expert, Carolyn Coston. How well across the sector, the recovery sector of anorexia, would you say that we're, how well are we doing at the moment? Well, I actually thought we were doing better. Um, I think there are some problems in translating the new research into practice. And I think there are some problems with um, financially with access to care and support. I think sometimes what happens, what I'm seeing happen all too often is a person with anorexia. And we're just talking about anorexia here, but I think it's the same for bulimia. I, I, I think it's the same for binge eating in this regard. A person, but let's just, if you want to stick with anorexia, a person with anorexia has all these rules, all these rigid rules they follow. You know, I can't eat after 5 p.m. I can't eat anything that has more than one gram of fat. I can't eat over a certain amount of calories a day. I have to weigh every, whatever their rules are. And I ask them, what are, the, what are your rules, you know? They go into treatment, and what often happens in treatment is the treatment now gives them a bunch of new rules. You have to eat this, you have to do this, you, you know, you're only going to, you know what I mean? There's just mm. this whole thing that they have to follow. And uh, when they get out, they go back to anorexia rules. And what I, what, what, what's missing in that is that internal shift. What's missing is that is helping the person understand the battle is between you and you. Getting them to, like I'll have them write down, um, like if they are coming up to a meal and they feel like I just can't do it, I'll have them write down all the reasons that their eating disorder self is telling them they can't do it. You know, whatever it is, you're going to get that, whatever. And then I'll say, okay, I'll give the paper back to them and say, write back from your healthy self. If you were talking to a friend, what would you say? If you were talking to that seven-year-old, what you say? You have it in there. I've heard you. You got to, you got to, but, but you have to, you can't just let them think about it. You can't, because they'll say, oh, I know what I would say. Go, no, you got to put it on paper. And you have to believe it. It has to be something you believe. You got to get their healthy part of their brain working again. And I think what happens in treatment is, we don't get to that. We don't get to them internally making a shift. There's a lot of, you have to do this and that. You, you know what I mean? Mm, I, I, I get it. So in a, in a lot of ways, it sounds 
like we have to approach recovery not just trading the anorexia rules from more rules. It's like how do how do we how do we frame that? Yeah, and how do you help a person have their own guiding principles and values? Like, I don't think I can tell anyone what to eat. I'm always astonished how people who treat eating disorders sometimes go into these camps about here's what your diet should look like or whatever. And I think, you know, we're going to have people in the world who have different, like vegetarians, you know. You're going to have people who want to do keto. You're going to have people who... So well, the first thing is to get rid of the fear around food, to get their health back, to get them their brain working better and all that, but, but not to be too, to let them begin to make this internal shift where how do I want to live my life? What kind of relationship with food and my body do I want to have? What do I want to have in my life? I always say to people, I can't make you recover. Nobody can do that. I hope I can make you want to, and when you want to, then we're then we're on the way, you know. And that's why key eight is is uh, key eight's about finding meaning and purpose, and it's all about it's kind of the soul part of the work I do, and it's the part that is oh, I guess it's harder for sometimes people to incorporate into treatment programs or practice, but it's really about well, how does this person sense themselves? Do they realize they're a soul that happens to have a body instead of the other way around, and treating their body as their earth suit? for living on this planet, you know, mm. and sounds weird, but I mean, it, to help someone get out of this driven sort of ego diet culture mind and have a different sense about who they are as a being on this planet and then all the different things they can do um, and all the different ways they can go with that and ways to bring meaning back in their life. And I, I think that people do better in terms of long term being long term recovered when they have a reason to be recovered you know mm. so it sounds like recovery is not just about perhaps changing the habits of someone but it's about getting them to explore within themselves as a person yes exactly you have a lot of control as a human being. You are very powerful. When people say, oh, it's more powerful than I am, it's taken over, I say, that's not possible. You give it its power. It's not like an alien being that landed on you, you know? Mm, it's, mm. It's, it's, you have channeled and given that aspect of your personality all this power. And I, and I look at their traits. So the researchers, when we did the genetic research, it came up with anorexia nervosa. I was telling you, you know, perfectionism anxious, compulsive, kind of seen as control junkies. And, and I looked at the researchers talking about this and I said, and I talk about this all the time, I said to myself, you know, I don't, I don't call myself a perfectionist anymore. I actually think that I'm just tenacious, you know? And I don't think of myself as anxious, but rather high energy. And instead mm -hmm. of being compulsive, I like to think of it as being detail-oriented, you know, like I'm getting stuff done. So I would say, so what I do with people is I say, okay, let's look at your traits and how are you, how are your traits liabilities or assets in your life? How can we take your traits? Because I think people felt, I think people felt um, like I had someone show up to my clinic once and say, well, I heard, I, I, I saw the new research and I heard it's genetic and so why bother? And, you know, I'm slamming my hand on my forehead like, no, 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 no. Yes, you have a genetic predisposition, but it's what we do with it that counts, you know? Like I was saying earlier, was I, was I um, counting calories in high school? I was, but I was also getting good grades. And so how do we help channel whatever your predisposition is from the, I call it from the darkness to the light? How do we take your traits and help those traits become something you use for your highest good? And it's the same thing. If, if someone bulimia tends to be more um, impulsive, and I talk about how spontaneous they are and how beautiful that is, and they're probably one of the most spontaneous ones in their friends and how they can take that trait and use it in positive ways, you know? So it's, it's it's, it's like framing things in a more positive light. Giving themselves back to themselves in a way that is useful, in a way they can use it, in a way that they see is good. Because I think people feel, we would talk about in the field how, oh, if we show that it's genetic, it'll take away the stigma. I don't think that's happened. I don't. And I think all the brain research that we've done, Tom Insel just came out with a book in, in the U.S., and he was the former director of the National Institute of Health, and he was one of the people that we were all happy in the field that he put a, uh, helped gear a lot of money towards brain research for eating disorders. But it's not really panned out all that much to help change things, you know. And I think 
Maybe it will, but I think sometimes we get lost in the weeds about things like that. I, I probably said several times uh, at conferences over the years, look, we've been doing that for alcoholism and, and drug addiction, looking for what's the genetic thing that's going to cause the difference, you know? And I used to say, let's say we find it. What are we going to do? Go test the population and say, if you have this genetic predisposition, you have to take these drugs? We're not going to do that anyway. So I was looking at, but we can see people temperament, even without doing a genetic study of their genes, we can see a kid who's kind of perfectionistic and controlling and type A and anxious, and we can start helping them learn how can you use those traits for your best good, you know? Overall, across the sector, how affordable would you say it to get, re- to get better is? Well, it depends on when you enter treatment. I mean, if you enter treatment and and go into outpatient therapy and you happen to get hooked up with a good outpatient therapist who knows how to treat eating disorders and who treats you individually instead of just sticking you in a box, I'm concerned about everyone wanting to do family-based treatment or everybody wanting to do cognitive behavioral therapy. Those are both important, very important, but they don't work in all cases. So you have to have somebody who treats you as an individual and looks at these aspects aspects that I'm talking about, then I think it doesn't have to be that costly. And also, it's why I'm training coaches nowadays. That's my whole, I have a lot of coaches in Australia. I have coaches in 16 different countries. And what I teach coaches to do are the things that I'm talking about right now. And coaches are a lot less, they're not licensed. They're certified by me. Um, I, I opened an institute after I sold my treatment centers and said, what's missing in this field? It used to be residential treatment, but now there's a lot of sober coaches and life coaches and leadership coaches, there were no eating disorder coaches and no training to help mm. someone know how to do it. So it's about a year program. It, it takes time. They don't easily become a coach. They have to do an internship and pass that and everything else. But then they go and they help clients like between the sessions. So if you meet with your therapist once a week, for example, you can meet with a coach who will go out and have that meal with you, go out with you when you're going to try pizza for the first time, take you to the store and help you buy a new pair of pants when you've gone up a size and that might feel traumatic to you. Um, If you feel like purging in the middle of the night, you can call your coach. These are the things that you don't really do with a therapist. They don't have the time to do it. And in some cases, it's not even really ethical for them because some coaches go over to your house and help you go grocery shopping and Mm, stock mm. up your house with food. And so I think that is becoming, I didn't know how big it was going to get, but it feels to me like it's like, interestingly, going to be a game changer in the field because people, you know, they can't just do it with once-a-week therapy, and when that doesn't work, they often end up in very costly and expensive hospital or residential programs, and I think this is a step in between, and and that's what I'm seeing. The coaching um, certification program has been open for three years, and I'm seeing now people who we prevented from having to go into a 24-hour care program because we got really hands-on in the trenches involved with them with a coach. Some of the coaches do virtual, some of the coaches show up and, you know, have have meals really with the client. But nowadays, especially because of COVID, people are doing it virtual. And some of them go and actually do live-ins in, in the home. So it's a whole new thing. Yeah, it, it sounds amazing. Uh, like, it, do we have, do we know if we have that in, in Australia? Yeah, yeah, I have. I have probably 10 or more coaches in Australia, and they are getting a lot of work. And, um, yeah, at the Butterfly Foundation has interviewed some of them. Millie Thomas, Michelle Sutherland, Mia Finley. Um, uh, there's there's a few. Um, Claire Middleton, who isn't doing it now, but she's one of the original people that helped start the Butterfly Foundation. She became a coach. Yeah, there's a lot of coaches. All you have to do is go to my website, carolyncoston.com, and it lists all the coaches and the countries they're in. And so you can see all the ones in Australia. Melbourne and Sydney and Perth, and I just got a new coach training from Adelaide. That's fantastic. Yeah, That's fantastic. Cool. Would you say that recover, does recovery look different in people depending on like age or, or gender? I think their process can be different. You know, uh, I think their role models, some of the things that are the driving force, for example, for males, sometimes, uh, yeah, it, it's it's a little bit different what might be the driving forces behind it. But I think the steps that I was talking about in terms of eating disorder self, healthy self, in terms of making goals and then having a, a coach or, or sometimes dietitians, you know, do some of the work that kind of like coaches do. Um, the thing about, about the motivation, the thing about the having the 
internal locus of control so it's not external from a treatment program. All that stuff I think is the same. I think the whys are different. I think the way they feel around other people and the motivations um, can be different. But I think that that's why I say treatment has to be individualized, you know? And I think people sometimes who have, like, you know, a transgender or a gay or lesbian person might have other, those might be factors that helped propel them to develop an eating disorder, for example, or, you know, some of the underlying reasons I was saying. I And I think that it's important to heal those. But like I said, I think you can get better and and work on those behaviors and stop the eating disorder behaviors. And a lot of people can do that and then go on to continue to work and resolve some of the underlying healing issues that take even longer maybe to, to change or to heal from, you know. Well, it was fantastic having you on the show today, Carolyn. Oh, thank you so much. It seems, seems so fast, but you can see, I, I love my work. I love what I do. I love helping people get better and teach other people how to help others get better. So thank you for having me on. My guest today was Carolyn Coston, anorexia recovery expert. Tune in after a fortnight when we release an audio documentary, a double episode, using content from all of our 13 episodes of our anorexia series. And if you like this content, check out the Wellbeing Podcast for more. Thank you for listening. I'm Jack Hodgins. And all of us at Wellbeing wish you well.